What is up, everyone? Welcome to another MLOps community meetup. Today is something very special, and I hope you all are as pumped as I am for our guest. Uh, like always, I am going to be giving a little musical intro, and it is so fitting for the meetup that we have today. We're going to infuse some offbeat, out of tune, human music. <laughs> and then later, we're going to be showing the pristine and very well put together computer music. So we've got Suresh Joshi. And I want to just let you all know who is joining us. Let me just make sure. Can I get in the chat? Let me know if you're, can you hear that all right? Here we go, here we go, let's see. Extensive experience in web, mobile, and ML engineering, and enjoys making artful projects with code. He also performs sleight of hand. Magic and is currently pursuing a postdoctorate degree at Goldsmith University of London. We're so happy, so happy to have you here, Suresh Joshi. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you, man. How you doing? Hey, man, that was so awesome. I never had an intro like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You uh, did not realize what you were signing up for, did you? you were... I did not. That was really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, sweet, dude. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here. I know you're going to take us through all kinds of cool stuff. And for anybody that is in here with us, uh, throw in the chat. Where are you coming in from? Like, there's people all over the world, and I'd love to see where you are dialing in, in from. And then if there are any questions that you may have throughout the presentation that we've got, feel free to throw that in the chat and I will happily uh, stop the presentation, jump on screen and ask away. So, dude, I'm going to hand it over to you, man. I think we uh, we did the AV test earlier, right? So hopefully... <laughs> it still works and everything goes as planned. <laughs> do you want to do you want to take it over? You want to try and share your screen and uh jump right mm -hmm. into it? We can take it over. I can I can also open it with a little sleight of hand magic oh, trick. Oh, dude. <laughs> Guys, if you uh I hope everybody can see this. I have a little yes. card here. Nothing but a simple plain card. And I'm going to try to make it vanish in 3 and as soon as it vanishes, then we'll start the talk. In three, two, one, just like that, the car disappears <laughs> and it comes back right away. Oh! And now we go into the magic of machine learning today. And we can create a front. That was epic. That was the first time we had some magic happening on the meetup. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, by the way, cannot see the chat. Is there, I guess, Demetrius, you would echo it, right? If there are questions yeah. or things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll stop you in case anyone wants to um, Perfect. ask any questions in the chat. I'll jump back on screen. Sounds great. And I'll have some prompts. Like, I, I would like to get some input. We'll do some demos. And Demetrius oh, cool. can be the voice of the audience. He can, you know, speak out. And uh, and then I'll enter those values because we'll do some some live demos and we would like your input, you know, versus just me talking throughout the time. I want like some interaction. So oh, that's so cool. 
with that, let's just dive into it. Um, so, do do do. So, I hope you're for the right talk here. It is about creative AI, AI to create art, music, even jokes or humor using modern machine learning techniques. And uh, very thankful to Dimitrios and a bunch of other people. Uh, I know there are a lot of people behind the scene who run this awesome community of MLOps for, invite, for having me here. And uh, sorry, we last time there was a hang up, there was an issue, but I'm so glad that uh, everybody who's here, you guys are here and uh, very excited for this thing. So you can contact me, my email is here. Uh, also, you can find me on social media. My social media handle is here. Mention the MLOps community as well and the hashtag creative AI. If you find anything interesting, you can take a screenshot, share that on social. So I already had the wonderful introduction. Uh, just a brief little add on to that. I used to be an engineer in the Bay Area for many years, doing web development, mobile, and recently got into ML, but more from an engineering standpoint than a data science point of view. And uh, now I decided this fall to pursue a master's degree uh, here in London, where I'm at now at Goldsmiths uh, University. And uh, I love doing magic on the side. And uh, if you want to see some of my magic and other things around creative AI, they're also on social media. And again, my handle and email is there. On the right is a picture of me. San Francisco in front of the Bay Bridge. And then I use the little technique, we'll look at it today, called style transfer, where it takes a painting style of Van Gogh and a picture, and it combines those two. And then it creates the one that you see up top. Um, so it's one of the applications of creative AI. <clears throat> the really hot thing this year, especially uh, if you are on social media, I'm sure you've seen this, are realistically looking images, artful images, realistic images, illustrations that are uh, that have kind of taken over almost the web. Um, and a couple of you know companies have been dominating the scene, and now a couple of uh, people from uh, startups uh, and also research labs have been showing their work. So. These are the name of the models, uh, you know, some of the popular ones are Crayon, Dali, uh, or Mini Dali, or Dali Flow, Mid Journey, another company, Stable Diffusion uh, by Stability AI, Dali 2 by OpenAI. And how these models work is essentially uh, they're prompt based models. So you type in a prompt, prompt is generally a text. But a prompt can also be an image, which becomes the input to the neural network. And from there, the text or image or text would be uh, transformed into an image. So there is another model that would transform uh, or convert text to image. Oops. Is, uh, da -da -da, what happened? Sorry. Sorry, I pr pressed the button. So the text. It's translated to an image, and then based on what you were looking for, it would render, it would provide that image. So we'll do a demo. We'll see this live. But there is a nice comparison of the pros and cons of these models. Some of them you have to pay for. They are not free. They are not open source. Some of the other ones are open source. If they're open source, they have certain limitations or uh, what should I say? policy that how you can and cannot use them. So there are uh, various guidelines. Fidelity wise, they're all up there. They are all pretty realistic looking, pretty awesome diffusion models. So what are these models? You know, I know this community is, you know, about machine learning practitioners. So you guys already may know these things, but just so if people are coming from the art side or they're kind of new, one high level slide here. So there are a couple of ways to generate images or even text-based you know, uh, models or even music and audio. So to do that, there are uh, 
you know, various types of generative models. And on the right side, I've listed out four popular ones right now. GANs used to be really popular. It stands for gener uh, G uh, Generative Adversarial Network. VA is Variational Auto Encoder Network. Flow-based models. And then diffusion models. And they work slightly differently. They have slightly different um, pros and cons. Not slightly, actually quite different in some aspects. In the left side is an image that shows essentially three key attributes, high quality, right, of the sample of these images, let's say, diversity, you know, we want, we want a rich diversity, different types, right, uh, coverage, uh, a broader coverage. And the diffusion models have proven uh, really good at it. GANs or generative adversarial networks, they are uh, faster. They are high quality, but they're, they're also faster, may not be as diverse. And that's where they, they you know, their strengths are. Uh, variational autoencoders are flow-based models, fast samplings, diversity may not be as good quality-wise. Uh, high level, kind of like, you know, uh, their uh, devil is in the details, but high level differentiation and uh, what they look like. If you have any questions, you can ask me and we can dive deeper into it. But that, these are the models. Uh, the diffusion models, these are all diffusion models, essentially, that have kind of like taken over because their their fidelity, their quality is really good. Um, so, you know, but this is the current state, but this is not, you know, where it started. Actually, it started back in 1960s. There is this popular AI-based system called Aaron, built by Harold Cohen in 1960s using good old-fashioned AI. And it was like an autonomous system that would create art. He created this. I think uh, reminiscence of this is, can be found in Computer History Museum in California or other places if you look up online. And then there has been, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm jumping uh, straight to like the last decade, let's say, of generative art, which, which was not using neural network, but, but a different type of generative uh, models. And, and there's a whole field called generative art with before uh, AI-based generative art or the deep net neural network-based generative art existed. And one of the popular artists that uh, I admire, his work I follow is Zach Lieberman. And you can check him out on Instagram or read up his Medium article. And he talks about how he created. And, and the reason I like this is because here the artist is doing, is doing more work than providing a prompt input. You know? You're actually writing code, uh, which which has some logic that dictates how the generative art. There is randomness, uh, but but there is more more uh, what do you say more effort or more thought uh, than than you know some kind of a black box that creates fantastic images. So there one is one sec. Can I jump in real quick? Real quick. Yes. Um, Ashe is asking about the diversity part. He didn't really understand when you mentioned that. Yes, the diversity, the diversity is essentially the breadth of the different types. So you may, you know, in prompt, so you can provide, uh, let's say image of, pick your favorite, like Queen Elizabeth uh, wearing a Japanese kimono. Um, the popular diffusion models would probably come up with something, you know, uh, that would be real looking that the Queen Elizabeth might be, you know, if she actually wore something that would, it would look like that. Uh, so it, it is, it is trained on millions, probably even billions of images. It, it's very diverse, the, the, uh, it's, it's ability to create images based on the various adjectives in your prompts, uh, so the so the data set uh, diversity in the data set essentially. Any other questions? And I'll link a article by Nvidia where they go much deeper into these three attributes, and then they talk about how to overcome the limitations. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah, we're looking good for now. I'll I'll pop back on screen if there's another question that pops up. Sounds good.
Um, so, you know, the AI art, so this talk is going to be, I'm going to cover from an artist's point of view, from an engineer point of view. I'll show you code, but we'll also talk about other issues around AI art because there are a lot of issues around these things. So one of the, you can say controversial issue was, was a famous art piece auctioned a few years ago for almost half a million dollars and by uh, Christie's, which is a famous uh, art auctioneer. And uh, it was created using open source technology. Uh, but the person who created the open source technology did not get a penny, but the person who used it to create the art, this is one piece, you know, the piece that was sold. You can see on the left side picture, uh, that person made a lot of money. So mm, there was questions around attribution, you know, was this right? Like, I mean, the whole idea of it was the first art piece that got sold, you know, that itself raised question around bigger art community that is AI art even worth that much, you know? Uh, it was this just a one-time novelty thing. So I just want to share these with you to get you thinking. And and so the the there is something here, but there it is laid with controversies as well. Um, so another thing that recently happened was in Colorado State Art Fair, an AI uh, bot that created an art won the competition. And as you can see on the Instagram screenshot here, uh, by the Colorado State Fair, they show the picture and the prize, the first place, and it upset a lot of artists. Um, understandable, right? Because nobody expected, you know, an AI to uh, one, compete, second, to beat, but it did. And it won the competition, raised a lot of questions. Third one on the very right is a person who wanted to copyright an image for an AI model. So the copyright not to his name, but he said it's completely autonomously made by an AI model. So the model should get the copyright license or copyright to, to that image. Well, the court uh, dismissed it. Uh, they denied that. Um, they said that it had the, you can see in the codes I've uh, written, the human authorship necessary to support a copyright claim is basically what the uh, US uh, Copyright Office uh, and, and, and the court, they said. So, it didn't go through because imagine if that would have happened. I mean, you can generate models and models can generate various kind of like, you know, uh, artifacts, images, text, and all of that can be copyrighted. And there uh, we can have all kinds of problems. Um, so there is a popular company called Getty. You know, they sell stock images. They also have banned AI-based images to be uploaded to their website. Uh, mostly for the copyright reasons, because it's not just that the problem is that AI models can be copyrighted. The problem is also that how do you, uh, how do you say that this model, what it's copywriting, it's original, you know, it, it, because they're trained on data sets that are publicly available. Uh, when I say publicly, I say it very loosely, you know, because a lot of the models, honestly, they scrape the data from various websites. They may or may not have permission. So, so, so there are a lot of issues around that. Uh, so, just wanted to share that with you. Uh, it's not all hunky dory. There is laid with controversies as well. But it is a promising technology. You know, we should all definitely learn it, use it, but be mindful of these issues. Um, a couple of more issues. So. People, uh, you know, some of the, like I was saying that some of the models, companies have put guidelines or policies because some people were using these prompts uh, to create uh, uh, porn, pornographic uh, deep fakes, you can say, and, and uh, you know, or something else like violence, some other kind of things that um, probably, you know, we don't want to see or we don't want to have uh, and 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 uh, so there there is that aspect also. So some models they explicitly ask you to you know agree certain set of guidelines that you won't use it for this this this, 
and, uh, and then you can use those models. Uh, then there is also, you know, in the last few years, if you were anywhere in the NFT or the crypto community, you probably heard about NFT art, and it got flooded with AI-generated artwork. Um, you know, it, the AI-generated artwork now, you know, it's it's everywhere, and especially it 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 flooded the marketplaces that sell those, like OpenSea here in the screenshot you can see, and you can right now today go to their website and you can see and you can buy um, and you can post your own. But what does that say about art? You know, when it becomes commoditized and is generated by an ML model, uh, what happens to its value? So, so there are all kind of questions, philosophical questions. And lastly, we'll look at this website called Fake or Real because I want to show you where the current state is. So let's, let's play a little game. If you were live, I would ask you, but maybe Demetrius, if you're here, tell me which, which one is real, the left one or the right one, the woman or the man in this picture? <laughs> I'm going to wait also just real fast in case people want to put in the chat. Yes. Too. Uh, so I would say the left one. I'm not going to let any of the okay. chat. Well, let's, let's find out. So I clicked it. You are right. It's correct. The image wow. on the left is real. We'll do one, one more. more. Give me another one. Give me another one. I'm on fire. All okay. right. I'll let the chat. I'll let the chat speak. One with the glasses or without the glasses? Right. Oof. This one's harder. Uh, I'm gonna go with right. Right. With okay. Left. Okay. I think uh, you're good at this. You have looks like played this game before. <laughs> no, dude. This is the first time. But you know what? I I feel like wow, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. This is a website made. There's another website made. It's called uh, I forget the name, but the website. These are GAN-based models, so uh, not the you know. And it's at the bottom. It says actually style, and now we have style GAN two and style GAN three, which is the latest one. Um, as you can see, they create very realistic images, yeah. and uh, and there are a couple of there used to be a couple of tricks that you would you know like or tips such as like actually you picked a good one so generally messes up the the generative models they mess up the background um, you would see some weird artifacts yeah. in the background in this case you can clearly see the people in the background so i i would also wager that that is real let's do one last one um that's what i was gonna say uh i was gonna mention normally when you see and ashai is talking about this person does not exist.com uh, yes normally when you see those type of fake photos you have a very plain background if like you have a background at all and so yes. then there's no like shading and so that's why on that other one when the dude had glasses and he had like half of his face was shaded that kind yeah. of made me be like all right yes. i don't think this is real this one's a little bit harder because i can't see so clearly the background on that i want to say it's the one on the right is fake because the background okay. looks a little distorted right okay let's find out uh man you got yeah. three out of three you should uh put some money in to... yeah <laughs> I'll deep fake. Deep fake. like send me your deep fakes i will tell you if they are real or not there you go so uh, yeah, this is a website, and they explain how it works, and uh, and and you can you can play with this, uh, uh, and and it's uh, linked, and you can read up uh, about you know their research and all that. So Stylian is the popular generative model. Uh, well, now we have diffusion models that can also create this, but style gains were known, still are pretty good. And style gains have been, you know, up, up being updated every year. So now the style gain, the latest one, I think, is style gain three. Uh, it generally gets updated, yeah. Uh, and and it can create not just human images, but cars, uh, horses, and there are a few other classifications that it can create. And uh, uh, so, yeah. Um, you can read up. It's Stalian. It's very cool. So I think I might have a demo. So let's go back to the slides. Video generation model. So text, you know, image generation was taking off. And recently, 
couple of researchers. So this area, area is moving really fast. You know, even the talk I'm giving today, I've, I've curated a lot of new stuff. But believe it or not, a lot of stuff is coming out every day. So this one was released by Facebook. And I just want to show you. Actually, we'll go here. It's not hyperlinked. No problem. We'll do that. And uh, Facebook. So if images was not enough, now you can provide the text prompt. And, and on the right, it will create an image, a teddy bear painting a portrait, uh, surreal. You can give it a realistic touch or a stylized touch. Uh, so this uh, may take a while to reload. Um, this, is, this is just uh, you know, their website. Uh, this is not the model. They haven't released the model yet, but you can sign up. I signed up for this. So, uh, but as you can see, you can provide an input can be, again, doesn't have to be text. You know, even the prompts, it can be video. Ultimately, it's a vector, right? It's a vector representation that, that is your seed input. So it could be, you know, that could be text or a video or image. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then it creates, you know, other videos uh, based on that, um, as we can see here. So it's really awesome. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can sign up. Uh, uh, for the access, and then you can flood your social media or, <laughs> you know, put your Instagram and Twitter, uh, fill it with this, and hopefully it'll go uh, viral. So there is the paper written about it. So you can, you can read it uh, um, uh, when you grab these slides. Uh, and, and this is stuff uh, generating video. So imagine what kind of possibilities would that open? You know, now if you want to create a YouTube video and you don't have a budget to shoot or even a camera, you can perhaps just write a little text and get a video and edit it and you have a video. Uh, so let's let's look into code. Let's dive into some of these models. So first we'll start with stability.ai. This is not a code. This is a this is a online model. So Let's just do it in Google Chrome, or we can do it here. Um, so this is their studio. And again, this, oops, sorry. This one, it comes, it's for free, uh, at least for now. Uh, I didn't have to pay for it. Unlike uh, OpenAI's, you know, uh, they, they all, uh, OpenAI also gives you a certain number of credits, but uh, the credits run out pretty quickly. And uh, they have, you know, various models, GPT-3, DALI, and various other models, so you can play with that. But uh, stability.ai is, is, has been the new cool tool, so let's use that. Demetrius, from the audience, just give me a prompt. A prompt, you know, would be a little bit description of what kind of image we want to generate. So it could be a person's name, a famous oh, person, oh, I like that. Uh, a style you want, or some kind of object it should have, or a place. Yeah, just just whatever your creativity is. Uh, so I'll let I'll let the audience throw in some ideas here, uh, and while we're waiting for them to come up with different ideas, uh, I'll think of my own too, in case nobody wants to say anything. But there is something cool that we could prompt, maybe. Because I'm a big fan. So we have Roman in the chat or in the actual audience. And he is in Lisbon. And I love Lisbon. So maybe we could do something with Lisbon in the meantime. Um, um, I'm just wondering. There's I'm wondering what we could do uh, with Lisbon. Maybe somebody, some person in Lisbon. Or, I mean, what else do we got? Where's everybody at sure. in the chat? Let's go with. Ooh, uh, ooh, ooh, we just whoa! There's a really crazy one that I don't <laughs> even know how to explain to you. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in our chat, but it's the Tower okay. of Babel that reaches to the Vault of Heaven. Whoa! And yeah, that's some that's some next level creativity. I was just saying, Lisbon and we, Paul came out of nowhere with that. Congratulations, really Paul! People. Nice. Yeah. Okay, let's throw that in. By the way, we can also put, provide images. You can see on the right, we can 
change the parameters a little bit. We can ask it to create more images. Right now we're pressed for time, so we'll just do one image, change the height and width of fit, pick different kind of model. This is the latest one. So let's let's give that as an input and uh, let's see what it does. Yeah. Tower of Babel. That re there you go. There you go. If you have another one, that was pretty quick. We can do. Perhaps we can do. Uh, we can we can do. Yeah. If, if you have another one, we can do another one. Um, you can see what that does. Uh, so different styles, as you can see. You know, I guess the wow. first and the second they all can be used in games too. Um, yeah, but because I've seen prompts images uh so, so these images are you know i think definitely uh hd but even higher um so yeah because also like i've seen some wild prompts where they're like a paragraph long and you have these <laughs> parentheses and then parentheses and parentheses and parentheses type thing um with the different yeah. styles and the different types of artwork that you want to use yeah it's it's exactly you know you can go crazy so there is a prompt guide here i will look at this so i'll just type something by the way i want to go with an animal right so there it is you know an animal and uh and uh yeah so um and if we had you know we, we can create more so play with this sign up for this it's free beta and uh and uh, you can play with this so there's a guide so they provide you you know what how you should you can provide you can just provide one word prompt right or like you were saying you can do very complicated ones you can say animal i want something something or a skeleton right um you can then give it a style because it's trained on different style right so you can you can say realistic while hinting other types of stylist art do you want photo uh, a photo plus prompt you can add you know like this plus there again Famous people, you can type their name or famous artist, and uh, and uh, yeah, and so play with it. Uh, there are certain uh, you know other uh, tips and tricks, um, and I've linked to an article that gives goes more into it, and they've played with different other models. But this is the fundamental. You don't have to be you know. You just need to be able to think of something, have a creative idea frame it in the right words and then iterate and then generate multiple images see which one you like i, I guess that's the role uh, right now of ai artist and it is also my uh uh you know what, what is the word like my beef with it is that i am uh, a lot of people who are calling themselves ai artists are they really ai artists because all we are doing is typing in you know a prompt and uh and the ML model is doing the hard work. So I guess we are doing some kind of a curation. There is some human in the loop, but uh, are we the artist? I don't think so, personal opinion. Uh, and it's also a controversial subject. Let's look at StyleGAN3, what actually we, we looked earlier. I'm gonna open this in Chrome. Sorry, ignore my uh, browsers with tabs. So do do do. Let's just open in Safari, I guess, because I already have it set up there. Oh, I don't. Hmm. So this is the challenge with live demos running no Jupyter notebooks or Google Colab notebooks is okay it did not clone it is that it one it takes a long time so for now let's re let's just do it um uh, so the here it is so i don't think like live if it, yes if, if everything went smooth, it would be a little suspect. Yes, exactly. You know, the live demo. So, um, so 
a lot of this code, it comes with notebooks, or it, it, it may not be in form of a book, but it, there might be a GitHub repo. But very easily, I'm sure you're familiar with notebooks. You can convert that to a notebook. And uh, Google Colab is an environment. You can get it for free, which is limited, which is what I'm using. You can pay, and you can get the pro version, but it gives you access to NVIDIA GPUs. I have a Mac, so I rely on that a lot. And uh, so it's just gonna pick, you know, one of the one of the machines, and, and it's it's picking the GPU Tesla four, which is good. Let's just quickly see. You can get through this, and as I can, uh, we, uh, uh, so style can we saw creates realistic looking images, and we're just running just running the the code. Uh, it's a pre-trained model, and we're just executing it. We're just doing. We're, we're just going to run with, as an inference. So, but we have to set up the notebook completely, step by step. So there are all these prerequisite needs to download. Uh, so while it's doing that, so it's going to download all these dependencies. Then it's going to ask me to hook up my Google Drive because it generates an image. And if you want to save that image locally or then this is tied to your Google Drive. So um, that, that is what it does. And then it fetches the model and uh, it essentially would run uh, this model uh, and uh, the another model, which is the clip model, which, which does uh, uh, text to image. Uh, and the style can four comes in four pre-trained options. The FFHQ is the most popular one for human faces. And then there are now other types of uh, images that you can generate uh, based on other pre-trained models. So, this step takes the time and then running the model takes a little bit of time. Um, and then, and then here, as we can see, we have a text, like a prompt, and we can provide it a seed and the optimization steps. And, uh, and then you see the, it will generally print the iterations of that. Um, and then you start the inference. And then finally you save the model. So, so it's taking a while. The other way to run it is you just run all the cells and we can try that because otherwise we'll have to wait for each cell to complete. So let's come back to this and I'll just run all for now. And it's gonna run one after the other. And we can come back to this because this will take a little bit. So stable diffusion, which is the popular diffusion model. So you can use this GitHub repo. It is also available in Hugging Face. You can use Hugging Face API. If you want to use it programmatically instead of just there, you know, the web version, uh, you can run it on your own machine if you have the right environment or on the cloud like I'm doing. And uh, this is what, you know, it creates very realistic looking illustration images. And uh, here are the steps to run it. Uh, and, and there it is. So again, um, if this, so for example, here, it doesn't look like have a Jupyter notebook. But that's okay because you can you can enter the uh, all the Python code manually and uh, in a, in the Google Colab notebook and you can run it, or you can if you have installed it locally and you have the right uh, GPU, um, then you can execute the Python script directly on your computer, or you can run it on the cloud. So, okay, there's a prompt here. Operation canceled by the user. Hmm. 
Got a lot yeah. of fun. Did you see that? <laughs> yes. Challenges with live demo. We'll come back to this. Uh, we can come back to this later. Uh, but let's go back to, to the slide. There's a lot of stuff to cover. Let's look at some work created with music. So in 2016, there is there's a band that, uh, not a band actually, Sony Research Lab. They created a song. It was the first AI generated song. And this is what it sounds like. So this song generated a lot of buzz uh, because, well, it was the first AI-generated music. And, you know, uh, when something like that happens, a lot of people who, uh, who are in the industry, they are, like, taken aback. Uh, so the first pop song, and uh, sounds like Beatles. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah. It, yeah, it was it, very Beatlesque, wasn't it? Beatlesque, yes, yes, exactly. I was just thinking, and, and, I gotta uh, incorporate and, that into the intros. Yeah, and exactly. So you know, there you go. <laughs> but you know, this talk, you know, it's not really, uh, you know, I mean, there are various ways. We'll talk about this in the end. How these things can help human beings, right? Uh, we can use them. Uh, you know, they can. Uh, I guess because if everything is done autonomously. Uh, I don't think it'll still be, you know, we, we, we want some human input. Uh, so talk about that towards the end. But yes, you can certainly, uh, certainly incorporate or use AI to assist you in your music making or uh, certain things. Uh, and then after that, there are a few bands also who, did it, uh, who used AI to generate the lyric of the song, but they sang it, they performed it. So, you know, we'll look at it. AI can not only create you know, lyrics, but melodies. It can, you know, it can it can do other things uh, like uh, style transfer too. Um, so another example is CocoNet. So this is a Google Magenta project. Google Magenta is a uh, research lab at Google where they actually do a lot of creative AI work. So they use AI for artistic purpose, for music, essentially those two. And uh, they've created a lot of projects and demos. So uh, they've created tools and a lot of the notebooks are available as well. And uh, even a JavaScript library. And I use this library, I'll show you. But uh, they have created plugins for uh, VSTs, uh, for, for if you make music electronically. But this was the paper. and. Uh, just look at the abstract quickly. So just so you know what it's doing. So it is basically, it's completing a music melody. It's creating a music melody. So I'll let you read, I'll open this for 30 seconds and let you just read the abstract. So essentially, it will complete a music for you. We can start. Nice thing is that it comes in a web app. So I'm going to run that now. So they've built this cool web app, and it tells you what to do. The model is trained to fill in the missing portions of the four-part Bach chorals. So we can draw a melody. Demetrius, you're the musician here, uh, but it's hard to do it because I have to do the input. But uh, I would love to hear your feedback. So 
I'm gonna fill in a few blocks. And uh, I'll let the model fill in the rest. So as you see. I guess I should have played it before filling it, but I guess we can play it right now. So as you can see, I filled in certain notes and it's going to, it's filled in the others. Uh, and then this is the different style. I'm not a musician, so I don't, I'm not familiar with these terms, um, but uh, we had a temperature, conservative, and one greater than one is random. So it is set to more close to a conservative, different scales. There you go, there, there is your melody. And you can now save this. Uh, we can change certain things, I guess. Yeah, that just, I would imagine makes the... Uh... I'll reset That's, it. Yeah. So this is what it is right now, right? Not very musical. I just put some random notes. And now I'm going to ask it, we'll create, I guess we already, I already started with that instrument, so we we'll stick with that. Go to 0.5. E scale, okay, to fit it in. E's a good scale, that's what I played your intro in. Oh, cool, okay, there we go. <laughs> Let's see what they give me. So, you tell me how good this is. It, I guess the more you provided the input, or the, the better, well, you don't want to, completely write it by yourself. But I guess if one, you have to have some musical sense. And uh, second, uh, you need to, this is where iterations come in, where you gotta tweak it and see if yeah. it generates something that you like. So really cool uh, tool, allows you to run it on the web um, and you can read the paper and it's, it's called Coconut. Um, there is another tool, and these tools, they call it algorithmic comp composition because they're composing melodies. So there's another one called Cypher out there. And I'll just show you this video. Hello, this, everyone. My name is Life. The it's X not a, one. I don't think and it's an open video, source tool. I'm going to be showing you how you can turn any ad in. But I want to show you this. Guys. And I just wanted to put a new melody on the outro part. So I, I, I do. All right, let's, let's do it like let's put it on youtube so you can see a full screen oh yeah nice hello everyone my name is life with the exclamation point right and i just wanted to put a new melody on the outro part so i used audio cipher this is audio cipher it does very similar thing there's this little text box here and you can just add any word and it'll turn it into its own melody let's put transform just because that was the first word i saw you can change the root the scale the note duration to however you want it to be so let's put this on G and put the scale to minor and let's leave it at one fourth. Okay, yeah, one fourth sounds good. Over here, you have this function to drag to MIDI. Let's put it there to DAW, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So there are a bunch of things that you can do to make this sound a little better. Firstly, I want to put so that velocity There you down. go. I hope you got what he did. He typed a word, and based on the word, the model created some kind of a melody. He didn't even start. This is, is text-based. Like, he gave it a prompt here. He gave it a scale, the, the root, and the duration of the note. And then, what, then, then he played it, and then he got MIDI code out of it. Which I guess he used in the, he he brought it in some kind of a DAW like Ableton or something, yep. and then you, you know change the instrument and you can play that. So, so this tool is really cool. Uh, but I like their blog by the way. I've linked their blog because they they've written good good blog, but it's a proprietary tool. So you know 
I generally I prefer open source tools. But if you read their blog and if you're really interested in music and AI, they have a really good solid posts. Um, they have how to use other music AI tools. They cover a lot of magenta, uh, how to write songs. Uh, they talk about their tool. Okay. They also talk about magenta tone transfer and DDSP plugin. And so, so this is, I think I might have it in the next slide. Yes. Okay. So we'll just talk in the slides. So style transfer, you know, they saw the picture that I put my photo art, combine it, artistic picture, right? Same thing can be done for music, style transfer for music. One style of music, combine it with another style of music. So Google Magenta created this project. Uh, there are two of them. So there are two of them, they do, they're doing essentially the same thing, but in different ways. One is using, they're both deep learning models, but they're using different techniques. One is using a differential digital signal processing approach, basically working with raw audio data, and the other one is using a different approach. So, and, and you would see the difference in the quality. So we'll skip the video. So here, let's pick birds chirping. Right. Now, uh, Demetrius, which one would you like it to transform? So, same sound, but transform into a wild sax. Which, which, sax. Yeah, I oh. gotta go with sax. Okay. Let's go there. Let's start again. You remember the bird sound, how it was, right? <laughs> So, there it is. Uh, let's see if flutes sounds Oh my god, that is a trip. You can use a violin. So, it is essentially... Uh, so it's trained on all these sounds. Generally, a lot of the uh, music models you would notice they're trained on the, you know, they would make box sounding music or in this case, classical instruments because that's the data that's generally available in the open source, you know, or copyright, you know, uh, free. Uh, so, so, so that's what it's generally trained uh, on. Um, so the original training data, you can listen to the sample of that. Some music, you know, played uh, in the violin. That, you know, bunch of music like this was used to train this model. And then now what it has done for this input, it has provided this output, which is the transform style. But so parts and pants, let's do one more. And uh, yeah, guess. We can do go with the saxophone that he said. Um, oh my God. So, yeah. Amazing. So, so, it's a really amazing, you know, it's a really cool project. And uh, they made a nice video about it. How it does, they show you this is the audio spectrogram because um, essentially the audio data get converted into image. Uh, using something called spectrogram. And then, you know, we've all done this, all this research work around computer vision, right, uh, based techniques. So you train those images to under, to detect the features of the audio data. Uh, um, the other one, a uh, different approach, it's, it works on raw digital signal, uh, not in audio. Uh, not, not using the same technique. So this is another project by Google, Differential Digital Signal Processing. And they have a collab uh, notebook, uh, demo, audio samples. Um, they use spectrogram, but they also use digital signal processing uh, 
technique approach. So here it is, the high level architecture, I guess, an encoder, decoder, and then there is a multi-scale spectrogram loss function. And uh, the encoder decoder model convert, well, I guess one is used to detect the filtered noise and the other one is getting the harmonic audio. And then it creates a reverb from that and then you get the synthesized audio. And then of course there's your loss function that optimizes for it. So I'm sure it's much more complicated than that, um, but I highly recommend you to play with this. Um, again, this won't work on your computer. You definitely need a GPU. Uh, but the nice thing is that here is the Google Colab notebook that you can uh, run it on. So, and Google Google's uh, Google Colab not notebook are very well documented. So that's one nice thing. There are other companies, Spotify, um, OpenAI. They have also done a lot of work around music and AI. And uh, there are other areas around music and AI uh, that one very popular one is called music information retrieval. So for example, applications like, um, like uh, you know, you, you ask Siri or Alexa, hey, what song is playing? Um, or how, uh, think of how Pandora works, right? Like they use machine learning to, uh, in, to uh, understand the data, they mine the data to under, to grab the music. So for example, like if I play a tone and I say, hey, you know, I just play a little bit and I say, oops, I say, what song is this? Well, it would have to understand it, right? And then it would have to do information retrieval based on that limited data and, and, and figure out uh, what, what, what is, the closest song to you know what I just like uh, made up that tone or that tune. So information retrieval is a is a you know big field where it's applied. Other creative approaches. So one application that I made during the pandemic and we gave a little talk about it is called the uh, musical diary. And uh, a few years ago at NeuroIPS workshop around uh, around the creativity track. Uh, we presented this paper, so you can read about it. And uh, I talked about it a little bit, and I worked with uh, with my, with my two other friends. And uh, it was part of Google in Gray Area Hackathon. And, and I'll just show you the live app. So this is the app who won the won the won the prize. So it's basically a journal. So we used Magenta's JavaScript model. The a uh, variational autoencoder model that comes as magenta.js library. And then uh, we also used a uh, small model that did sentiment analysis. So this is an app that allows you to journal your thoughts. So here, for example, what I can write. So as you can see, so things I like to do is I like to make make applications. You know, I'm more of a application developer, creative coder, like I said in my intro, than a data scientist. So I used we use three of us actually. We use um, so this we can replay it. So it essentially allows right any kind of a journal or thought and. As you're, as you're typing each letter, it creates a note. And the exclamation mark gets a, gets a special note. So, uh, and then based on this, this text, actually based on each word, uh, the model does sentiment analysis and then gives an overall score for the sentence. And based on that score, it would play the music that we just heard, the piano music, it would either play more for like a sad or a happy melody, and uh, and and so uh, how it works is uh, the the project is on GitHub as well, 
and you can read up about it, but, but it uses uh, magenta.js, variation autoencoder, to interplay between the happy and the, and the sad melody that it generates. And then, uh, then the sentiment analysis, then it's a React-based application, web application, you know, where we capture and it replays and you can share it and all. So just wanted to show you that, you know, these models, they open up a lot of possibilities, but I think the really exciting thing, at least for me, is when I see applications like this, or when I see applications, you know, like we saw like this, when you can apply these in creative ways, right? When you can make an application that uh, wasn't possible before. So, so that's, that's uh, I'd like to highlight those. So um, mentioned in the title of the talk that we're going to talk about jokes and humor. So I'm going to show this model. And uh, this one is a really nice project. So I'm, I'm opening a lot of doors in this talk. I'm showing you a lot of projects and I'm in the slide deck. And I encourage you to grab these because you know, a lot of people have been generous to put them. Well, these are well documented, not the GitHub projects that, you know, don't have, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, documentation and not being used. This is, you can see a lot of the stars because it is kind of cool. It takes a text input and it generates a meme uh, using that. So this person made a web app and he made a iOS app that does the same. Uh, actually. Uh, so, um, so you can, you can, if you, if you want more content to share on your social media, um, well, since the audience is developers, I would encourage you to download his model and build your own app, but, uh, but you can, you can using, using, you know, it can give you different types of meme. Um, sorry, the resolution is not, not the best, but, uh, it generates meme uh, memes, um, yeah. And in the code base, it uh, this person is also it's it also is using a library because he is building it for he's building it for iOS. He uses TensorFlow, but he uses a special version of TensorFlow to package it up for iOS uh, using code or ML. So it can be, it can, it is uh, optimized for mobile, mobile devices, it's smaller model. And then, uh, and then uh, yeah, you know, this person is also building the app. So, so, so that is one, the other project is, uh, uh, if you like puns, you know, a uh, very popular form of humor. Uh, if you want to create puns, uh, then you can, you can you can use this uh, really cool project and uh, always like to see if if they have examples. Uh, uh, not here, but I'm sure they have examples in their in their in their paper. So it's being used to create create jokes. Uh, you know, which are puns or memes. So I died a little inside. Uh, pun word died. Uh, not the most, you know, not the most humorous, not the most like, uh, you know, jaw dropping humor, but it, it is getting there. The one area that I, that I feel that can benefit more is jokes because I did some work, but it wasn't the joke weren't that great to be honest uh, but i just wanted to share what i found so far um joke gotta really, be so hard too like it's hard it's because 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 the way you know a typical joke works is a um it relies a lot of on common sense it relies a lot of uh, like on things that are not said and yeah. the way the machine learning models are trained is that it's trained on a bunch of data set and it it may take like a punchline from a different joke and and then the initial bit from a different joke and then it doesn't work like it because it doesn't it doesn't understand so it's not like images where where uh, it's there's more leeway jokes with language especially with jokes because it has to 
uh, work really well. Because if you if you remember before, um, you know the large transformer uh, like models came in before when AI was writing you know text, you could you could read the text and it made sense in the in in a very short segment. But if you looked at the bigger picture, it did not make sense because it didn't have the it it didn't have the larger context. And that's that's a, that's a similar challenge in jokes because it has to work the they call it the setup and the punchline and it has to tie in together. Uh, so so the jokes aren't uh, you know they're very I saw some uh, ones that really silly dad jokes but but it's for people I, I guess there's there's an opportunity for somebody who's doing research. Another place uh, this person is a professor I believe at Georgia Tech and he he has written a really comprehensive blog post on the state of storytelling or narrative, which can be used for games or, you know, whatever, comic books. Uh, so he talks about that we want the machine learning models to not just come up with a narrative, but to also understand high-level concepts like what is a plot or the story structure. So that when you are changing the parameters, you can alter these things uh, indirectly. So he has, he talks about a lot. It's a really good blog post. And he goes into the historical approaches of how, you know, older AI systems were used to create uh, stories and narratives. And now how the uh, deep learning is used to uh, create that. Because as you can see, uh, there is some kind of a, like a flow chart. But this was a previous approach um, where, you know, like especially in a game, in a, in a choose your adventure type of game, uh, you can go in very different directions, right? Um, a player can have a lot of choices. So it, it, it suited the, the, the framework of a graph, uh, but now, now uh, more, more different approaches are being used. So, so it is further down, they, they talk about the latest and the greatest which is the neural approaches. So he talks about the pop, some of the newer models, comet glucose, uh, that are generating, that are generating uh, short stories and narratives. Um, as you can read here, uh, like a couple of paragraphs. So, and, and this, you know, you can of course use GPT-3 right now, you know, the large language models as, as well, of course. You know, create uh, some kind of a story for you, um, but but uh, it 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 may not fit the need. Like if you need a story uh, for a game that has a lot of characters and a lot of plot points and a lot of choices, and uh, so there is a uh, this is also an area that um, th that is still being figured out, or we're still looking. You know, we're still we're still in the early stages of getting something what we have right now for images. Um, poetry is another place. So there is another AI artist that I follow, Alison Parrish, she teaches at NYU, and she has used GPT-2 and uh, some other techniques to create short poems. Um, so if you are a literature, you know, if you like poetry, um, you can you can use that, and then and then she's given a nice talk uh, about the same, how she created it. So, and an octopus the stone, an ode after Easter. So it's a it's a long talk, almost two hours plus long. But uh, but you can you can learn more about how to use language models to create uh, poetry. Um, so yeah, that's Allison and and uh, I want to be mindful of the time. So there are other questions that these you know models raise around ownership. We talked about it right with copyright. Uh, who is the real author and the owner, right? What about the credit? Because uh, the data, you know, it's, uh, it's 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 a lot of time is scraped. You know, oftentimes it's generated. Uh, but where does the data come from, and and do we have the permission? Because you know, today you can create you know a bunch of things using you know 
these popular models and then if you commercialize it um you know is that do you need to attribute is it okay to you know uh, is there legal challenges around that accessibility is another question that uh, is you know asked and should be asked because right now the nice thing is that a lot of these models uh one well it started off that you had to have certain kind of computer then it became to cloud computing now there are tools that allow you to run it on your local computer or uh, a website that somebody has created it and hosted it for you but still um you know how much technical knowledge do you need to have to be able to use uh, ai models if you are a creative and the big question uh elephants you know in the room is the job displacement question right what about like concept artists illustrators animators musicians writers what would the future uh of uh, you know in terms of jobs and career be for these people because uh, when ai uh is you know making progress around these areas will they uh will they be doing the same thing or they'll they'll have a they'll have to learn a different skill set or a different way of working uh or a different career so those are open ended questions and i have my my thoughts and i and i can share that with you um but i think as engineers as creatives i think this is a tremendously awesome technology uh so we should be using it and creating new possible exciting uh, creative uh, solutions out there and uh yeah i'll stop here and i'll take any questions and you can further contact me on email or twitter um yeah that's it so cool dude thank you so much for breaking this down i feel like that was the perfect 20,000 foot view of all of this stuff that we've probably all been seeing so much over the last year year and a half on the internet and twitter and linkedin and all these different places so it's super helpful uh, for anyone that is interested we're going to put the slides and the link to the slides in the mlops community newsletter that goes out i dropped a link to that in the chat if you are not subscribed yet and yeah dude this has been awesome i gotta jump to another meeting but no, I, sir. like thanks take a picture of this slide as well there is a course from mit around this subtopic of ai creativity there's a website that has a lot of resources so but yeah i think you'll get the slide link so you can to get these but thank you yeah. thank you dude thank you this is so cool man